It's really good to have you here tonight, and I know that we have a lot of people online. Thank you for those messages coming in. Uh, we're really thankful that, that you are joining us online, and you can put the kids to bed. I always said that I, I never understood the Lord's, the shepherd psalm until I had kids, you know, where the Bible says, you will make me lie down and sleep. I understand that now yeah, as a father. It's really good. Um, Brad and Beth, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, I know that you've been in South Africa for a while now. Thank you for touring. Welcome to Cape Town again. It's really good. I will introduce you now. And um, Brad will also be here on Brad and Beth on Sunday morning at 9.30 and again on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. And um, we're really thankful for the time that he, that he takes to impart, to really not just share something quickly, but to really impart the urgency of the prophetic call. He said he's not a prophet. There is a prophetic call in his books and in his message to our generation. And then secondly, also just to, to, to show us the hopeful, the hopeful title. So Brad published three books so about 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Uh, at his local church, he was awakened and alerted to, to the social media patterns of youngsters, young people that were absolutely contra church. So at night when the parents were in bed, assuming the kids were sleeping, the kids were doing strange thing in my space in the teenagers. And as a youth leader and a young adult leader in church, he was alerted to that and he started ministering on that. And being evangelist and on the radio, he started sharing the message about the dark side of media. Uh, the dark side of technology that we should be uh, alerted to. And a few years later, because of the demand, he wrote a book called uh, Digital Cocaine, uh, which I think many of us know. He, Brad was in a few times in South Africa on, um, on carte blanche as well. And he started collaborating and working with uh, the neuroscience department at the University of, of South Africa at UNISA and just doing research on the effects of digital addiction and digital patterns of young people and old people. And um, as such, Brad loves South Africa. He's been here a lot. And um, I'm glad that you're here. He's touring with his recent book. Please, at the back, at Beth can help you obtain a copy, Digital Rehab. More than anything else, I just love the hopefulness in this title. I love the hopefulness in this title, the fact that, that it is possible for God to, to rehabilitate, to change lifestyle, lifestyle patterns. It's not just useful for parents like myself, but also for young people and old people alike, because we all live with the age of technology. So first of all, Brad will be on Sunday morning and Sunday evening again at um, 9.30 and at 6 o'clock. It will also be streamed live. And then secondly, I want to just give an opportunity. Um, I think you know as a church, our heart is to seek the peace of the city, city not just ourselves. We really feel that we have a call, a mandate from God, an invitation from God to partner with God to bring shalom, to bring hope, to bring restoration, not just to our own congregation, but to the city in which we live. So for that reason, we invited Brad, as with the other conferences and things that we do, to come and minister here, not just to us, but to the people that we live in, to the city in which we live. And I want to invite you to partner with us. Um, we don't sell tickets to any of these events, but there are costs involved for Brad to be here and for Brad to move around in South Africa. And we invite you just to, to participate, to partner with us financially. I think there's a slide, ways to give. There's a snap scan thing there at the back. But also, um, you're also just welcome to go online and just to, to share, to contribute from your side, saying, God, I also want to partner with this church and with Brad's message to bring hope, digital rehabilitation. So for that reason, God, I want to, I want to sow into this ministry and into this event. So I want to invite you to do this with me as well. So Brad... Welcome. It's good to have you here. He was just sharing amazing stories of, um, of hunting from helicopters in Australia. Uh, so touring around the world also has, has an amazing opportunities. So thank you. Please put your hands together for Brad Huddlesworth. Thanks. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, I wasn't kidding about the helicopter thing. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Um, where, <laughs> first of all, this is where I'm from, and this is what we do uh, for fun. And then uh, and, uh, we do come from a very beautiful place. We, we love South Africa. It's a beautiful place here as well. And I, I was driving today um, miraculously on the wrong side of the road and all that. But uh, <laughs> no, I've been driving in countries on the other side for a long time. 
But I drove to some new places here in Cape Town, and wow, what a beautiful part of the world you live. I'll show you my neighborhood. That is my neighborhood. So you have more people in one square block than we have in our entire county. You probably have more deer and bear than, you know, than, than people where I live. Anybody old enough to remember that song, Country Roads Take Me Home? Those are the Blue Ridge Mountains that he was singing about. So that's where we live, and the Shenandoah River and all that. So uh, that's why he wrote that song. <laughs> it's pretty nice, but we love you, and uh, we love South Africa. And I've been saying to uh, Pastor and a lot of the audiences where I've been, the presence of the Lord hovers over your nation. He really does. We, we debuted this. I, I'm actually on a global tour. So we released on purpose, Digital Rehab in South Africa first. Then I went back to my country and debuted it in New York. And then I came back here, and then uh, we'll, we'll go home, and I'll have a tour in the States again. And then we're going to Thailand and Australia and I think the Philippines and probably other places. But that's how we feel about South Africa. And so my warning, if there is a prophetic warning, would be to get a grip on all this madness that has gripped my country. And don't let that happen. And then as a favor, send missionaries to America. <laughs> we need your fire. These are some of the folks. Well, this, this is where I do a lot of research when I'm in this country, um, at UNISA. And these are some wonderful godly folks who have graciously surrounded me. Some of the things that we want to do is get statistics and things because the last thing I want to do is come here and tell you how America does it and this is how you should do it and all that. So... One of the projects that I did right before COVID was we were talking about cortisol levels, you know, brain spiking, you know, when people's notifications are going off on their watches and on their phones, even if it's not on their person. You can see on brain waves that they spike, which means cortisol, a stress hormone, uh, goes surging through you. So I went to the department and I showed them this research study and I said, I'd like to build on this. I would like to actually measure the cortisol. And they went, great, let's do it. So they employed a uh, pharmaceutical company, and we learned how to take bodily fluids and put some people in the lab, tormented them with uh, notifications on phones, <laughs> and tested them. It was awesome. So uh, I'm a credentialed minister as well, so I get to preach a lot of places, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, education is a very big passion of mine, and uh, glo global homeschooling has happened. They had, the, had a conference, first conference in Manila, and so I was there. Because of the LGBTQ, because of the lockdowns and all this sort of stuff, homeschooling for a long time has been exploding in it, around the world. And a lot of people think that the homeschoolers, for example, are immune to a lot of these digital things, but that's not the case at all. Most of the homeschoolers have even more time with screens because they're not running back and forth to school in traffic, so all that time is spent on screens, and they actually have more time than most kids. So Australia is a big part of our lives, obviously, not just the helicopters and guns. Um, I work with law enforcement there, and so we do extensive touring, uh, doing research. They do. This is the crime prevention unit that the cyber is under that I work with. And so we're running around to schools, doing lots of research, and then, to be honest with you, this is. Oh, thank you very much. This is a, a door opener. This topic to get into places that may surprise you. These Muslim children are struggling with Netflix binging. They're struggling with video game addiction, porn addiction, just like anywhere else in the world. This particular community didn't have anyone to uh, speak into it, so I went. They invited me and trusted me. After the first session, they were watching me like a hawk because I'm a Christian, I'm an American, and all that. But they, gave, they just turned me loose with the students all day. And, uh, of course, you know who I represent. He's the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, and there's no other name under heaven by which a man or a woman is saved except by the name of Jesus. So that's what I do, and I'm fortunate to spend a lot of time on radio and television talking about these things and very passionate about that. And so I'm going to open with a couple of things. I want you to enjoy this. I'm, it's midweek, so thank you for being here. I'm sure you've had a stress-filled day and week. I sure have. I don't know if you think that, that touring the world and doing this stuff is glamorous. I'll have you know. <laughs> There's a backside of this that you don't see, and we, we have problems. Uh, last week, my mother was admitted to hospital with congestive heart failure, and so we had all that. I thought I was going to have to go home and all this sort of stuff, but God is, she, I knew that my mother was better because the, the only, I went through and cleaned out all social media but Facebook because it was just a time suck. So I just post pictures, like I'll post pictures of us tonight and then beg people to pray. That's all I do. 
But I knew my mother was better because she was going through every picture liking them. <laughs> like, Mom, get off your phone. <laughs> she, but she's four foot eleven, but I'm afraid of her. So I say these things from another country. <laughs> um, I just want to show you a couple of commercials to lighten the mood a little bit. And then in a few minutes, I'm going to take you uh, on a journey on the inside of the brain to show you what happens when our eyes lock onto screens of any sort. It happens to be a pretty big one. <laughs> All right, you ready? These are car commercials from back home. Oh, this has audio. There we go. Okay, this next one is Trunk Monkey the Chaperone Edition. Now, what I was doing actually, to give you a little illustration, I was uh, change the chemistry in your brain. I did, using a screen. And I knew that it worked because I heard you laughing and I did not even come out there and physically tickle you. I used a screen to manipulate the nucleus accumbens of your brain, which is the pleasure center. And I used a neurotransmitter, a little molecule called dopamine, <laughs> to alter how you felt your emotions. Now, um, don't get mad at me for manipulating you. You do it with your phone way more than I just did, okay? <laughs> Laughter is like a medicine, and there's nothing wrong with some entertainment until you get too much, and when you get too much dopamine, it becomes very addictive. But before we get too far into this, I just want to let you know, I don't hate technology. When kids see my book cover, they often think, oh, what does the old guy know about technology? And this went on for a long time, and I got this reputation as the guy who hates technology, wants you to burn everything. And one of my editors said, well, you should probably tell them what one of your degrees is in. So I started telling everybody, one of my degrees, I have a four-year degree in computer science. So I tell these little gamers, look, you little punk. <laughs> so you can install a video card and overclock it, and you're now an expert. <laughs> Um, but I'm not against technology because, for me, the, I would never put all of my eggs in the science basket. You should put all of your eggs in the Word of God basket. So science is very helpful to expose the problem, but not so good at solving everything. And I happen to believe in what is called the sufficiency of Scripture. Anyone on the same page as me, that is the final authority for all faith and conduct. So Paul said this, Everything is permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial. So I have a tablet that I'm using, and I created all this stuff. And it's fine. It's, it's, it's permissible. Some of it's beneficial, but not all things are beneficial. And then he goes on to draw the line in the sand, and he says, Look, everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything brought under its power, allowing it to control me. And that's exactly what addiction is. And you can see addiction now on brain scans. So when I wrote the very first book called The Dark Side of Technology, you could really poke holes in that book because back then we basically only had psychology and if you ask three different psychologists about it, any malady, you're going to probably get three different answers, three different solutions. And While they're very well-meaning, it can bring confusion and you can counter-argue pretty easily, but when the scans came out, it just shut everybody up and I was so happy. <laughs> I mean, the gamers. <laughs> so... But then you still get these guys, like these postmodern guys. You, you put that up there and they'll just go, I disagree. <laughs> That's cute, but <laughs> good for you. Like, all right, I'm eight feet tall <laughs> when I'm actually two feet tall. But I say, on what basis? 
I'll Google it. I'll figure this out. I'm like, well, you're just going to run into me <laughs> if you Google it. So, you, you know, you, you just, so I'll say, look, if, if you were to break your femur, like in two places, and if I were your doctor, I would have a terrible bad, bad side, bedside manner because I would put this x-ray up there and go, that's your femur. And it's broken in three places. And if you were to go, I disagree, I'm like, well, have a run down the hallway and let's see how that works out for you. <laughs> That's what I would do. But I'm not against things. Uh, what I want to do is introduce to you uh, Dr. Nicholas Cardaris. He runs a detox center. And he was being interviewed in, in Australia. And I want to start this off by showing you what happens when children are withdrawing. It's the first symptom of digital addiction. Parent, uh, adults do have the same symptoms, but we tend to focus on the children. But well, I just wanted to say this before we keep going, that um, the average age of a video gamer globally is 35. But when I ask, you'll get 12, 7, and so on and so forth, but it's actually more dads are gaming than sons. And they bring this into the marriage, and Beth and I find ourselves around the world ministering to wives who are pretty much abandoned by their husbands, yet they live under the same roof because of video games. And the sheer amount of hours that they play, neglecting the children and so forth, it's very common. But we'll start off talking about the children. Oh, I thought you was coming up to tell me to shut up or something. <laughs> Some people have. <laughs> you had that look, you know, it's like, oh, Lord, here we go again. Okay. You want to do that now? <laughs> Let's give her a big hand for whatever she wants to do. If you mess it up, I will shoot you <laughs> out of a helicopter. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> Hurry up, I'm trying to, my best to distract. <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, smack your neighbor. <laughs> okay. Is it okay to play this video clip now? Give me lift one leg and cut. <laughs> Are we good? Okay. Here we go. First symptom, if you are, are ever dealt with anyone who's an alcoholic, eventually they will have liver problems, and it could end up manifesting as, say, cirrhosis of the liver. They may jaundice, that sort of the turn yellow. Um, smokers will have lung problems. It could eventually go into emphysema. With digital addiction, both in children and in adults, the withdrawal symptom when you take the drug away is anger and aggression. That's the first one. But then it's also anxiety and depression. And so suicide is off the charts, cutting, and we'll get into a lot of this over these three sessions. There's answers for all of this, but I'll, I'm going to have to take you through a little bit of a dark journey um, to get to this. And the basis scripturally for this is simple. Jesus said, I am the way... I am the And then on the other side of the truth is what? Life. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And it's up God has charged those of us in ministry to tell the truth in love. And I want to just tell you, I am in my past, I am guilty of everything I'm going to talk to you about. I've been down this digital road and I have very little resilience now with Screen time, um, with my head feeling like there's a lead weight in there, and even before two hours, because if you're not careful, things can become irreparable, irreparable. So you have to be careful. Now, there's always hope. God has done great things for me, but I don't want you to think I, I have an edge on me toward anyone in any of these things. I've, I've gone down everything, and I'm on the other side of it now, and I'm, I'm healed for the most part. <laughs> Um, it comes back every now and again. So in this initial video, you're going to see children who have had the devices taken away and they're having withdrawals. And a lot of times before I started, you know, precluding this, um, people would laugh because it is pretty humorous what you're going to see until you get to the end and you see the first set of brain scans that I will show you that shows why they're withdrawing. It's damage in the brain. All right, here we go.
same reward schedule as a slot machine. It keeps you playing and playing over and over again to get that dopamine tickle. The screen itself, the rapid screen cuts, the radiant light itself, the hyper-immersive effect is stimulating in a way that television never was. So what it does is it raises our dopamine levels in a way that we want to chase that dopamine uh, effect. The sound, it's the, the achievement. Most of the games are aimed at feeling good when you actually get to the, the next level. It's always a reward. I'll pause this just before the brain scans. You see their ages. So this is the sort of thing that um, bothers me because as a minister, I still care about people. And the minute, Pastor, we stop caring about people, it's time to take a sabbatical. I'm serious. Because you may hit somebody. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but sometimes I think about people, you know, if you'd hold still and I hit you about right here, it would do both of us some good. <laughs> I've never hit anybody, I'm just saying. But the brain scans are repeatable with various scanning technologies. And over this series, I'll show them to you. The same thing coming in from around the world with different scanning technologies. That means as far as the scientific point of view goes, it's real. And it repeats. And here's the biggest problem that somebody like me has when we speak. Everybody agrees with this. It's hard to argue against it. But most of the people under the sound of my voice believe that they and their children are the exception to everything that I say. And there's not one single person who is an exception. So the brain scans or the, the animations I've created based on the, the work of Dr. Archibald Hart. Uh, and I'll show you the book. It's a good book. I think it's out of print, but it's called Thrilled to Death, subtitled How the Endless Pursuit of Pleasure Leaves Us Numb. And the numbing effect that I'll show you is called anhedonia, which are two Greek words put together. And if you take, translate them into the English, and meaning none, and hedon, which we get our English word hedonism, the ongoing pursuit of pleasure, you put those two words together, and it means you no longer emotionally feel. So the irony is the more you stimulate the brain, the more it shuts down over time. So at first you get the high, then it becomes more difficult to get the high because your brain is building up tolerance to the drug. So you have to chase the high. And then you habituate, meaning it becomes a habit or an addiction. So a few minutes ago, what I did was I locked your eyes onto the screen and I used your occipital lobe in the back of the head and your temporal lobes uh, by your ears with the monkey and so forth. And I triggered a release of that dopamine molecule, and it went in, and notice it's lighting up. So I'll show you some brain scans in one of these sessions of on fMRIs, MRI scans with a helmet on, that you can see the activity in the brain, and it lights up. So if it doesn't light up, it means that part of the brain has shut down. Does that make sense? Personality has changed, and then it can get so bad with certain drugs that people will steal from their own family whatever they have to do to get the drug. Children will trash the house, for example, to get to the games when the parents take it away. So the tolerance is exemplified by that barrier there. It's a dopaminergic barrier. Now look, technically it's a chemical reaction, but because I go into schools and speak to the little ones all the way up to the university in meetings like this, I had to make this simple. And so what happens is as the dopamine levels increase, the brain fights back, it builds up tolerance, and what it's doing is pushing out the extra dopamine, trying to defend itself from all that stress. And we don't get the message, or we do, but we, we don't want to stop because what we want to do with digital, we want to say, no, it's about balance. It's about limiting. It's all about, it's just a tool. It's how you choose to, all this is a lie.
Huh? Oh, is it? I'll go there and join them. It sounds like fun to me. <laughs> so what ends up happening, we, we tell ourselves that it's about balance, but we would never do that with real cocaine, although the dopaminergic effect with screens is identical to literal cocaine, and that's why we call the book Digital Cocaine. It's not a metaphor. It's neuroscience. But if I were to tell a cocaine addict, look, you're doing four lines three times a day, Let's take a balanced approach and just back it off to four lines. Now, they would love me, but I would kill them. Video games are doing the same thing, but when I say you should quit, not balance it, you should destroy the video game controller, they get angry. And they say that's an unbalanced message. I was on Radio Pulpit, and Janine was listening to me, and her eyes were really big, and I was talking about all this, and I said, there, Janine... I know what I'm saying. There are doctors listening to us. I know that. Listen, it's not going to be the doctors and the neuroscientists calling the radio station to complain. It's going to be the addicts. The doctors will back me. But I love the addicts. I was one. That's who I'm trying to reach. Problem is, the stigma that we have toward traditional drugs does not exist with digital drugs because the digital drugs are culturally acceptable. Am I, am I making sense? And so it makes my ministry extremely hard to fund. I mean, if, if you go into the interior Af of Africa with, as, or the outback of Australia and you take pictures, you know, of all the stuff and you call yourself a missionary, people seem to throw money at you. I show brain scans and they run. <laughs> Serious. It's not popular. But I'm not trying to be... I, I like to be liked. The reason why I use humor so much, someone famous once said, make them laugh or they will kill you. So when I see murder in your eyes, I'll tell a joke real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so the wall keeps getting bigger. Now notice the middle there. It stops lighting up and see it turning gray? I want you to remember that because I want to show you the brain scans where the brain has shut down compared to a baseline of someone who's normal. And it happens to be Minecraft junkie. So this is non-stimulation. The brain cannot be stimulated. And that has led to, and I'm going to fix the audio, um, because they came up here and said, admitted, okay, we give up, you do it. Just kidding. When we did the, I'm just going to talk to the sound folks. When we did the switch over, Satan possessed my computer, so now I'm casting him out. Okay. So that, that's what happened. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Okay, it'll work now. Watch this. So when the brain cannot get stimulation, we call that boredom. You ever heard your kids or grandkids say, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, and you think to yourself, how in the world could you be bored? You have more stuff than I ever had growing up. Well, it's because the brain has become anhedonic, and you don't need to scan, do a brain scan on the child. You could. You'd see it. But all you have to do is take it away. And those symptoms that we showed you will indicate that there's a wall of damage in there, similar to heroin. Now, this is shocking, but listen to me before I show you this video clip. There's not a parent on planet Earth who has done this on purpose. I didn't come here to call you a bad parent because you've used it as a babysitter. You have caused it, and you need to own it. But from God's side of things, you did not do this on purpose. You didn't come here to be condemned. Are you with me? We came here for course correction, and there's a God who heals, and He forgives, and He wasn't even mad at you to begin with because you didn't mean to do it. On the flip side, what I would kindly ask you to do is that from this point on, according to Scripture, you're going to be held accountable, and I don't say that with harshness. Please don't believe that your child is the exception. Please, are, are you still with me? You're looking at me like, well, mine really is the exception. I'm, my, my child is so special. And I will remind you that your evil little creature, as cute as they may be, they're born with the nature of Adam, and they need to be redeemed by Jesus just like you did and me. <laughs> and they're not perfect. Neither were I, was I or you. And they, they will gravitate toward this. So have a look at the, this new phenomenon that used to only be found in severe drug addicts. And we're talking about the heroin and all that sort of the coke. And now 
this anhedonia is turning up in children who've been babysat with the devices. Suicide is always the result of many, um, many factors. As we are not teaching kids as many skills to self-regulate and deal with difficult emotions, well, one thing that a device can be is a great way to distract. Not being able to have my phone for a week, definitely, like, I would get really bored and I feel like I would be stressed out. Typically when I get bored, I do pick up my phone. Like I had people to talk to, but they got bored. I don't know, it's just like something that I do when I'm bored. Oftentimes it's a child who's simply bored. Yeah, I'm pretty much bored. And I get so bored. Sometimes when I'm bored. Because they were bored. And they're bored. Boredom. He is so bored. My mindset's got worse and worse just because I felt so unproductive and I wasn't doing anything. And I felt like that's pretty common. You know, most kids are bored, cooped up, and feel unproductive. At 12, here again, I was helping my dad. We still were still milking cows. We were still raising hogs, carrying water. We still didn't have electricity. I had to have the tractor gassed up, everything hooked up and ready to go. So I mowed their lawns, some housework for those folks. I didn't even know the word bored. And if we continually interrupt that boredom with distraction, with screens, I think that we are removing kids' abilities to deal with their own thoughts. And then that carries the risk then of being in a situation where parents are fixing everything. And you combine that with situations in high school where parents have fixed everything. I've not been taught how to deal with my own thoughts. Life is kind of hard. I have no idea what to do with this. So boredom, from a child-rearing perspective and from a cognitive perspective, boredom is the gateway to creativity. Creativity is the brain's way of figuring out how to overcome boredom. When a child between the ages of zero and three, their brains will triple in size. The amount of neurons that are being developed during that, that time and that little sponge brain is taking in everything and they're mimicking their parents to a T. There's so much going on in there and what we're finding is if you don't allow them to become bored and let the neurons develop so that they're overcoming the boredom with their own creativity, when you put them outside with no instruction manuals, they will figure out how to not be bored. If you put them in front of a screen, it will halt that process. And it will overstimulate that brain. And in their little brains, the wall goes up instantly to where we have about, an, as adults, we have about an hours of resilience. And Dr. Cardars talked about the adrenal system getting on overload. In them, it's a little atomic bomb. And you need to, they want slow. Let me just give you an anecdotal illustration of what I'm talking about. I had up on the screen, and I, at some point I will put this up there, the, the, the single most effective thing that you can do to fix all of this is, there's a lot of things, there are a lot of things. I've written a book this thick on it, but this, the single biggest thing you do is, is take everything out of the bedroom digital, including television. Just do that especially with kids. I've never met a parent who's ever done it, but you should. And in one fell swoop, you'll, you'll fix about 80% of this madness. So this teacher came up to me, and he looked down at me because I'm short. <laughs> I'm so short, my feet showed up on my passport photo. <laughs> the people who's language, English is second language, you just hear, did you hear the second wave of laughter? <laughs> um, <laughs> happens everywhere. <laughs> like in South Korea, you have to wait three seconds before the second wave hits because the translator has to do this thing. Oh. I know, I'm a big racist and I'm a little racist. Uh, anyway, so this guy looked down at me, and he very sincerely said to me, as I had on the screen, no technology in the bedroom, and he said to me sincerely, he said, so if I do that, how am I going to wake up? And I looked up at this Nephilim, and I thought to myself, dear God, he's educating children. <laughs> but I just compassionately looked at him, this millennial, and I said, why don't you just go to Walmart and buy a cheap alarm clock? And he went, oh, yeah. What I suspect sincerely that his mother raised him on a tablet. Now, he's a smart guy, his IQ is high, but he couldn't figure out the simplest thing. Does that make sense? 
And so because of him, I had to add at the bottom, go buy an alarm clock. And I did. I put that on there. There's something I want to talk to you about that is out of control. It's mind-numbing, and it's self-harm. Self-harm manifests itself in a number of ways. Predominantly, it's cutting, but I was at a school in Johannesburg, and I met this girl. I'd, I'd heard about this before, but I actually encountered it. She had scabs all over her hand, and she would pick at them and never let them heal. And there's reason why she was doing this. Um, and I'll explain. Self-harm, the, the reasons why people self-harm, the list is really long. I'm just going to give you several of the ones at the top. Number one, it's, it's a bad home life. It's stress from, from chaos in the home, whether it be a broken home, parents arguing and fighting and swearing and all that, or one, a, a one-parent home, and, and the, the stress is just off the charts. And the, the brain of an adolescent especially can't take it. You combine that with being digitally addicted with a wall in their brain from being on social media and all the things that they do, the dopamine can't get in anymore, and now they're emotionally numb, which anhedonia is also known as non-sadness depression. And so what they have done is figured out how to release another hormone. These are called endorphins. For those of us who work out and you use that for stress relief, it's very effective because not only are you releasing the endorphins that give you a feeling of calm and peacefulness, but you're also burning off the cortisol and the other stress hormones from the adrenal system that have collected during the day. But typically, kids are sedentary, so they're never burning off the bad. They're just adding more to the soup. Am I making sense? So they'll cut or pick or bang their head. They do all kinds of things, but predominantly cut. So they'll cut, and the brain senses that injury, and it releases endorphins, and it makes them feel again. This girl came up to me, and, and these kids come up to me all the time and show me their cuts. And I just have nothing. I'll hug them and minister to them and talk to them, and Beth and I will just do whatever we can to help them. And this girl came up to me. She showed me her cuts. I said, sweetheart, why'd you do that? And the first thing she said was, she goes, it makes me feel. Now, she's not talking about the cut. That hurts. She's talking about the emotional response from the endorphins. And then she said, it makes me feel calm and peaceful. There's a two-pronged problem with that. First of all, they dissipate quickly. So you cut, you feel the calm and peace, the hormones leave. And if you want to continue feeling calm and peaceful, what do you have to continue doing? Cutting. That's why the lines go up the arm. And then the second problem that exists with this is that they're addictive. They're very addictive. And so the wall forms against the endorphins. And as time goes on, they, they don't feel it as much, so they have, just like an alcoholic, they have to cut more deeply and more, and more widely. Does that make sense? To generate higher quantities. And then once the coping mechanism runs out, it'll stop working after a while. This darkness sets into the emotions, and it's most often accompanied with suicidal thoughts. And we're having children committing suicide at record pace. Uh, when, I, when someone found out I was coming to Cape Town, they contacted me and said, we've had three suicides in a year at this one school. Would you please come? Pastor, that tugs at your heart. So I, I agreed on my day off to do it. I was in Johannesburg, and um, I had Beth in the back of the auditorium with a camera, and I was in with some grade sevens. Now, look, it's not, I didn't say it's just because of Johannesburg. I do this in my country. I do it everywhere. I said to the students, I said, look, I didn't come here to embarrass you. Uh, I, we come because we care about you. Um, but I want to ask you a question, and I don't want you to answer for yourself because I don't want to point you out. Nor do I want you to answer for someone in the school. I want you to think of someone that you may know outside of the school. How many of you, I asked these grade sevens, how many of you know someone who cuts themselves? And here's the picture. And that's the same reaction globally. This is out of control. And my heart breaks. So this girl came to me last week, Cutter, and she, little Afrikaans girl, very sweet girl, and she was very intimidated because her English wasn't that good. So she brought an older person to translate for her. And through this conversation, she said, I'm a Cutter, and uh, this is what I told her. I asked her, I said, do you know God? She goes, no. I said, well, listen, I know why you cut. Oh, I'd already talked about it, but I said, you're getting the peaceful feelings, but you know, it's going to run out. And I, I laid the gospel out for her very simply. And then I said to her, listen, sweetheart, I know someone that I want to introduce you to 
And, and if you will get to know this person, you will never have to cut yourself again. In fact, he has a title. His name is the Prince of Peace. And if you'll invite him into your heart, that peace won't come from the cutting. It'll come from inside where he lives. Would you like to know him? And she goes, yes. And she began to weep, and I led her to Jesus. That is the solution, if you really want to know the truth. A power outside of what they're getting from this. I'm going to show you a cutter from here in South Africa. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. And when I do, if you're not medically inclined and you can't handle this, I totally respect that. I'm going to ask you to shut your eyes. But I want to, for those of you who can, I'm going to make a point, okay? So when I count to three, you shut your eyes. And then I'll tell you when you can open them. So please don't look at this if you get squeamish with this sort of thing. No shame in that, okay? One, two, three. I just want you to see the progression. The older wounds that are healing, they're small, but the recent ones are very wide and very deep. All right, you can open your eyes. So for those of you that were able to see that, do you see what we're talking about now? It's a progression and it gets worse. And then the suicidal thoughts will set in. So let's look at some of the other symptoms of digital addiction. I've already covered the one. You saw it on the, on the video with Dr. Cardaris. It's the anger and it's the aggression. The second is anxiety and depression. With, sometimes with no other known causes, when I'm talking to doctors and physicians, I will tell them, um, in your diagnostic cr criteria, if you've gone through, you get a kid that comes in, they're depressed, and they may be cutting themselves, and they have all these anxiety disorders, and you're trying to figure out the root cause, and you've asked about the home life, prior abuse, and all this sort of stuff. If they, if they check out, and, and there's really nothing that you can't figure out, I'll say, just ask them if they have a phone. And then they're, they're going to look at you like you have a second head perched upon your shoulder, because <laughs> everybody does. But here's your, here's your script. Here's your prescription. Take it away. And give it four to six weeks, and then reassess. See where they are. Now, nobody will ever do this. And you think, I think to myself, why do I keep gallivanting in the world, living in perpetual jet lag, having to raise money to speak to people who don't want to hear me. But I hear the Lord saying, plant the seed. The harvest is up to me. So it keeps me going. And occasionally we see results. Not very often, though. But that, that's the answer. It's not limit. It's not balance. You have to quit the drug. Do you see what makes this so difficult, what I do? And I have to tell pastors sometimes. They'll go, not here. You guys are tough. It's my country. That pastor asked me, how are you going to word it? English? <laughs> but I knew what he was saying. Are you going to make my people feel bad? I'm going to try not to. I'll crack lots of jokes. You know, I'll do all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, they're drug addicts. <laughs> if you're addicted, you're addicted. And there's no shame in saying, hi, my name is Brad. <laughs> I have a phone. <laughs> Extreme irritability. Now, we all have these symptoms because we live life, but what we're talking about, when any addiction sets in, it exacerbates the natural. We can manage this because we live with Jesus. You can cure this on a daily basis by going into your closet of prayer and reading the Word of God and really getting intimate with Jesus. It, you can crush the head of the serpent with that. Problem is, when you have this much and God is telling you to repent or if you want the toned down version detox same thing and you have to quit they'll come right down another symptom induced ADHD and ADD totally created by a device kids who did not have it suddenly have it and get a diagnosis some children are born with it organically very few but they're doling out medicine like M&M's, Astros. I love those little things. We don't have those in America. I just bought a box today. <laughs> I'm serious, a big one too. There's no sense in being a wuss about this. <laughs> go, go big or go home. So just let me show you this. This is from the Cleveland Clinic. Researchers found by age five 
Children who spent two hours or more per day looking at screens were 7.7 times more likely to meet criteria for a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, than children who watch screens for 30 minutes or less. I don't know a child on planet Earth who watches less than 30 minutes a day. I mean, if you just want to be honest about it. The chronic sleep loss, accumulated sleep deficit, is causing anxiety disorders. That by itself, and when I tell parents, your child must have every night consistently nine and a quarter hours of sleep, they look at me like I'm crazy. I didn't come up with these stats on my own. These, this is from sleep clinics that have tested this over and over again. And for an adult, we need eight hours of sleep. Otherwise, you're not going to be emotionally well. You're going, <laughs> most of you aren't. Listen to you last night. <laughs> it, was a, it was a nervous laughter. It wasn't like, ha, 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 ha. It was like, oh, I'm stuffed. <laughs> I hear this all the time. I trigger, trigger you psychotic people all the time. All right, now. And then we've already spoken about the emotional numbness. So let's just look at some of the other symptoms. Loses track of time when on electronics. It becomes agitated when interrupted. Prefers to spend time using electronics rather than playing. Does not follow time limits loss of interest in other activities, seems restless when not using a device or preoccupied with getting back on, avoids homework and chores because of spending too much time with electronics, and sneaks a device when no one is around and lies about it. Sound familiar? I mean, not you, your children. <laughs> Just kidding. I know you do it too. Okay, what I want to do is I want to show you, I want to start to talk about some of the solutions. And then I'll take a few questions and we'll pick it up Sunday morning. Is that okay? And then I'll, I'll hang out for a little while afterwards too. Uh, if you want to chat, I'm happy to do that. Because I, I mean this in all sincerity, I uh, care about you. If there's anything I can do to assist you, I will while I'm here. So, ladies, uh, I haven't put this up yet because it gives the answer. Can, it's not a trick question. So don't be going, oh, what's he going to do? Don't do that. It's a sincere question. Ladies, can you multitask better than the men? Yeah. Well, think about this. Mother has three children. And they go throughout the house on a daily basis, rummaging, pillaging, trying to burn the place down. <laughs> they do. And mom can manage all this with the dentist appointments and running them to school and picking them up. And where's dad during this whole chaotic episode? He's on the couch. Because if dad had to do all that, the children would, would die, right? <laughs> so women can juggle more than men, but I'm talking about digital multitasking. That's where you sit down to do your office work or the kids have the homework, but there's a phone there with earbuds in, and there's multiple tabs open, and they're jumping all over the place. And they say, I can multitask and learn in that environment. And what neuroscientists has proved over and over conclusively that any, any nerds here with the IT people? Uh, okay, you'll get this uh, multi-core processor where you can take one big project and divide it up and it comes and spits it out pretty quickly. That's multitasking. Your brain is not like that. Your brain has one core. That's it. One processor. And it, that's it. And it used to be taught that you could multitask and... <laughs> When the productivity went down, this is a real number, you can write this down, when the productivity dropped 40%, businesses went, uh-oh, we better stop saying that. <laughs> and then when they taught, not all companies have gotten the memo, but the ones who now don't operate that way, their productivity went back up. So for those of you who doubt me, and there are always people who do, you think you're the exception, because most people do, I'm going to ask you to multitask. But not five or six things like you normally do at one time. What I'm going to do is just ask you to do two things. So by definition, the belief is multitasking means that your brain has the ability to receive two or more streams of data simultaneously and cognitively you can retain that information and regurgitate it. That's the definition of multitasking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a written poem on the screen and at the same time, I'm going to play a second and different poem being read audibly. And I want you to pay attention to both at the same time. And then I'm going to give you a cognitive test 
to see how well you multitask. Make sure the volume's up, please. Thank you. Are right, you ready? Don't look at me. Look at the screen. Ready? The moon seems very lovely each night it passes by, so beautiful and shiny upon the velvet sky. And yet the moon is really dead. Its light is not its own. Though shiny it may seem, it's really just a stone. Okay, how many of you tried? Raise your hand. You participated. Hands down. How many of you got about two seconds into it and said, no, this is not going to happen? <laughs> how many of you got about three seconds into it and said, oh, forget it. I'm just going to pick one and do the best I can on this stupid test. <laughs> okay. Now, remember that. <laughs> how many of you picked the written one? Lazy. Now, <laughs> that's exactly right. You are. Here's the test. I don't want you to quote both poems. As brief as they were. I just want to know who can, word for word, just quote the first two lines of each poem. Word for word. They're brief. I mean, super brief. You know why? I've given that to hundreds of thousands of people and no one has ever passed it. You know why? You can't multitask. So here's what happened. You started off reading, because you're lazy, and you can't, you hear mumble. Then you switched. We don't call it multitasking. We call it switch tasking because you can only do one thing at a time. You switch and now you're listening, but you can't read. Then your brain got stressed and did you a favor. It defaulted to its default setting, which is one thing. It did it for you and you still failed. I'm sorry, I don't give certificates of participation. I'm from the old school. You failed. Now deal with it. Grow up. Try again. Repeat the second grade at the age of 30. I don't care. Just get through it. So what do you do? Well, I want to show you how this works. Kids sit down to do their math. I keep forgetting to put the S back on it when I get to South there. I tell the Americans, they're so smart over there, they do maths. <laughs> we only do math. So, you, <laughs> told you to make them laugh or they'll kill you. <laughs> so, kids sit down to do their maths, and I ask them, I have pictures of this too, but I just, you have to trust me because I don't want to encroach upon your time. Um, how many of you, I ask the children, uh, students, how many of you listen to music whilst you study? And every hand goes up. That's problem number one. Your brain is switching. Every time there's a volume change, every time there's a new song, your brain is switching back and forth. And they will say to me, um, I study better with it. And I'll say, look, I get where you're coming from, but let me correct you. You don't study better with it. You can't study without it. There's a difference. And so they sit down to do math. And then I will ask, how long do you study a legitimate subject and those of you who are adults in the office, they could be the report for the boss, they could be the presentation, same thing with, with adults, no different. How long do you study maths before you grab your phone and check something? And they will sincerely say, you remember that bullet point that said loses track of time? Well, they will say, I study about 20 minutes and then I check something for about five. When the cameras were put on a large pool of students for long periods of time and the tally came in, they studied for two minutes and then they grabbed their phone. And then they're gone anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour depending on how big the wall is. Am I making sense to you? But they will tell you that they can learn in this atmosphere. And so this is called not only switch tasking, but it's also known in neuroscience as toggling. So what do you do to fix it? Well, you monotask instead of multi. You do one thing at a time. So when you sit down to do your math, you have to have total silence. None of this is going to work until you detox because you cannot wean with digital addiction like you can with other drugs. You have to go cold turkey, and it takes four to six weeks for your brain to detox from digital addiction, a minimum. Depends on how long a gamer's been gaming. Some of them have to go through multiple times. With porn addicts, it takes about eight months before they start to see results. And I'll show you brain scans next time on what a, that screen addiction looks like. It's horrible. 
So you need total silence in the office and when the students are studying, which means you can't be listening to music, which then means you can't have your phone because that's how they're listening. And then no entertainment tabs. I had to add that one during COVID. I was doing a lot of webinars. What we found was there was the Google Classroom or the Zoom or whatever platform that they had, but they also had TikTok, they had porn, they had email, they had all, Twitter and all this other stuff open. And they were spending all their time on the entertainment tabs and not the legitimate ones. Because they have no pre, the prefrontal cortex that they spoke about earlier, that's where impulse control happens. That's the last part of the brain to develop. And none of us have the full breaks until we're about 25. And regardless of age, if you're addicted, you have no breaks. You can't, that's what addiction is. You can't quit. So the nucleus accumbens or the pleasure centers like the gas pedal mashed and the motor is revved and you're going 100 miles or kilometers, 100, let's just give us 180 kilometers an hour and you have no brakes. That's what addiction is and that's what entertainment does. But this is the cure. Under these conditions, you then do one thing at a time. It's called monotasking. When you need a brain break, you don't check anything digital or your wall will go up. You do analog. Do you remember paper? <laughs> remember paper? <laughs> Stuff like that. Do anything that doesn't involve a screen for your brain break, listen to music then. That's a great time to listen to music. Your brain will reset. And the brain wants about two hours of deep thought for cognition to happen. And then you take about a 10 minute break, non-digital break, then you come back for your other session and your productivity will go through the roof and your retention will go deep. And then the hippocampus that stores short-term memory will transfer properly at night when you sleep the proper amount into a schema, a contiguous scheme of data Otherwise, it's going to go in scattered, thus leaving you with a scattered brain. So if you're a teacher, let's make this practical. Let's say your math lessons are on Tuesday and Thursday. And on Tuesday, you're teaching geometry and you cover equilateral triangles and, and you give the basis to move on to something more complex. And on Thursday, they swear you never gave them the background. But then you pull out the lesson plans and say, look, you evil little creature, right here it is. <laughs> and the reason is, when they study in that toggling fashion, the brain deposits the information in a scattered fashion, and they have a real hard time drawing an association between what they previously learned. That's what digital education has done globally, and much more. It's not so good. So in way of helping you, I would recommend that you delete all of these and never use them again, including all video games and never play them ever again. Based on scans, I've never seen a healthy brain scan. They, to my knowledge, they're all damaged. So similarly to a drug, I would never recommend that you smoke. I would never recommend that you do coke. That would be very immoral of me to do that. And because of what I know, I tell gamers, you should quit. And then one kid actually did it. Shocked me, because I've never, I've, he's the only one I've ever met that actually quit. And he came back to me after doing a detox, and he goes, ah, oh, I feel so good, I'm sleeping, my brain switches off now. And he, he went on and on, and he goes, I even got my money back on eBay, and I went, dude, you're a drug pusher, stop selling that stuff, now I gotta go talk to the guy that bought your stuff. <laughs> I was serious. <laughs> You are hard enough. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Research shows clearly that you learn more when you read from paper instead of a screen. So study after study shows this, and research also shows that you learn more when you take notes on paper instead of typing them. So let me relay to you in a paraphrased quick fashion on where one of the studies that showed this. They put a podium in the middle of an auditorium, and they said to this half of the audience, we're going to give a lecture, enjoy the lecture, take notes on any device you want, any way you want, type them, whatever. And to this group, they gave them pen and paper and said, take notes, enjoy the lecture. So they gave a lecture, and at the conclusion of the lecture, they tested to see which side, how they compared. The side that took notes on paper crushed this group. And then they did the research to figure out why. Generally speaking, here's what happened. This group tended to type word for word. Problem is, they could not type as quickly as the professor could speak, nor could they multitask. So while they were still on point number one typing, he was already down into point number two and three, and they could not hear because you can't multitask. 
This group tended to do bullet points. Not all of them, but the majority just did bullet points and key words, which showed they were actually engaged with the presenter. So they did better on the test. Am I making sense to you? So the last two things before we take questions, I want to show you this. I wondered, I wondered how the people in Silicon Valley in my country who invent all this stuff, how do they raise their children? My assumption was they have, you know, technology that's two years in advance that they would already have in their homes. It shocked me. So I'm just going to condense it with this one New York Times article, a Silicon Valley school that doesn't compute. The chief technology officer of eBay sends his children to a nine-classroom school here. So do employees of Silicon Valley giants like Google, Apple, Yahoo, and Hewlett Packard. But the school's chief teaching tools are anything but high-tech, pens and paper, knitting needles, and occasionally mud. Not a computer to be found no screens at all, they're not allowed in the classroom, and the school even frowns on their use at home. So why would they sign up for this? Walter Steiner, I spoke at one in Johannesburg, and it's true, they're, they're, they have no technology, they don't like it, you have it at home, because the school is doing everything right based on all this science I've been giving you, why you shouldn't have it. Well, they don't want the home to undermine it. They don't want the kids coming to class with a wall in their brain. They don't want it under my, so the school does everything right, the school does everything, but people ask me all the time, has the tech companies come after you? They agree with me. They love their children. Not yours. <laughs> Theirs. I'm serious. They adore their children. They could care less about yours. They want your money. Steve Jobs didn't exist for your best interest existed for his best interest. Speaking of Mr. Jobs, he was a low-tech parent. New York Times, so your kids must love the iPad. They haven't used it. But he knows you think your child's the exception. And you'll still buy it. But he knew better. He's not going to let his kids use it. He sees everything I've... I mean, this, this is why they don't come after me. They know. They're open about it. It should disturb us. So let's end with this. I've given you tips, have you noticed? They're just not the ones you like. Can you imagine if Joel Osteen had to use my, have my topic? He'd be in a mental institute. You can't smile your way through this one. <laughs> hey, comes from my country. I, I'm going to talk about him. <laughs> I have a right. I don't know what right that is, but I'm going to take it. So get it out of the bedroom, and I'll leave it with this. I'll give you a whole lot more tips next time. The book is thick. These are fourth graders. And I had just asked them, how many of you, your parents allow you to have internet connected devices in the bedroom overnight? That's how many hands went up. When we do research, we, we, we take surveys and they'll tell you, the phones, video games, Wii, Xbox, all this comes in, they all do it. So in this particular night, 500 of their parents showed up at a parent meeting. And at about this stage of the presentation, I said to these parents, so, how many of you parents allow your children to have internet-connected devices in their bedroom overnight? Seven hands went up. I said, funny that. Let's have a look at how your children answered that this morning. And they went, oh. I said, let's try this again and not lie this time. So how many of you, sheepishly, all the hands started going. They think their children are the exception. And they're not. The Lord has called me to deal with this subject because He loves your children. And I do too. I don't know them. But He's put that in my heart. To be willing to stand up in front of people and say these things. As gently as I can. Or as much love as I can. Because I hate no one. But the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, we have a serious drug problem globally in the Christian world and without. And as Christians, 
we must decide whether or not we are going to live holy lives again. We have allowed the culture to dictate our jobs, our lifestyles, and everything else. The Apostle Paul has instructed us to come out from all that culture stuff that's bad and separate and stop touching unclean things. And then if we do that, he receives us. So if I were to grab any phone on planet Earth, it would look like this. It would have a mixture of education and productive stuff and bad stuff. And if I were to apply that verse, it would simply look like this. People come to me all the time asking for prayer for the stuff that's created by that stuff on the left and the torment and the shattered lives. But no one from this side has ever come to me and said, Brett, I'm so addicted to Microsoft Word. (laughs) I can't stop typing. (laughs) All right. Apparently, I'm going to live tonight, Pastor. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Fire away. (laughs) Who who will break the ice? Who has a question? Raise your hand. Thank you. Give him a big hand, the bald man in the back. We'll just call him Elijah, and I won't make fun of you lest the she-bears come out of the forest and eat me. (laughs) Yes, sir. Uh, Hey, wait. What is your name? Say that again. And it, well done. Yes, okay, go on. Question? So, uh, I think I'm, you know, I'm, my wife knows that I've been on this journey. I know I'm an addict and I'm trying to like, get rid of my phone. So and you know if you don't confess it, she will stand up and confess it for you, right? <laughs> All right, go on. <laughs> but my question is, so it sounds like the only solution is to quit. And the only solution is to maybe get rid of my smartphone and to buy a down phone. <laughs> What's your point? You're right on. I mean, yeah. You know, in all seriousness, thank you for being transparent and honest in front of everyone. It's very helpful when people are like that. And I'm being sincere. What people do want from me is a solution. Like a pill or anything would allow them to keep doing all this madness and their brain not be affected, their sleep not be affected, their interpersonal relationships not be affected. And the truth of the matter is I've I've written a big thick book because there is no little solution that is simple. And so clinically this is what has to happen. If you're addicted, before you can come back to that split screen that I just showed you, you have to detox first. And here's the starting point, four to six weeks. And during that time, you cannot have any screens at all, including television. Now, what, what's going to happen, everybody panics at that. What happens is your brain returns to homeostasis. It means the chemicals come right. The neurons start firing again. You, you don't act like this is a bad thing. You have to change the way you think and go, that's a good thing. And then you go, I really like that short guy. <laughs> that's the first thing you should say. But... And then you come back and you use my definition of, or neuroscience's definition of limit, not that vague one you've been using for years. And that is that split screen. 1.7 billion people on planet Earth own a smartphone. There has been a revolt. In addition to that now, 1.2 billion have gone back to dumb phones. So the parents, the number one excuse that parents give me as to why their children should have a phone, a smartphone, is the emergency. And I say, you know, a dumb phone will take care of the emergency that never happens. But if it does, a phone call will do, and their brains will be fine. It's not the phone, it's the smart part. And so there are 1.7 billion smartphone users. There are now 1.2 billion dumb phone users. There's been this huge reversion back to that. So the old Nokia 18, 111, whatever those are, they've all been refurbished and remade brand new. And then there's light phone. There's all, I've written about all this. So thankfully, there's a movement 
that people are buying into, and then they give testimonies of how great they feel. Good question. Someone else? Yes, sir. Say an apple. Oh, I was gonna say if you're a Mac, well, right there's your problem. <laughs> um, so, so I, I speak a lot to big church AV teams, and I do a lot of I've done a lot of research with them, not formal, but th th enough that they tell me, Eunice, you can say this is the truth because the sheer number that say the same thing. So they'll come to me and they'll say, well, the pastor doesn't have any idea that when he wants a four-minute video that that's going to take five days. That's a lot of screen time because of the complexity with which we can do video editing now. I have a studio and a multimedia production company, so I know. So I asked them, so you're working 12 hours a day. What do you do when you get home? Oh, I decompress by playing video games. No, I mean, that's the most common answer. No, they're being sincere, and I don't put them down. Not right away. Um, <laughs> give them a little space, tell a few jokes, and then I'll lower the boom, and then at my size, I run. No, but, and then secondly, they'll say, well, I Netflix binge on series. And they'll say, what do you do when you get up? Check my email, or check to see if there's anything that's happened, you know, that they need me at work, or what have you. And I said, I explained to them what monotasking, most of them have seen what I've done. I explained to them when you are working, you monotask. Instead of having all this stuff going on, you'll get your work done 40% quicker. Instead of a 12 hour day, you can back that up. But in the mornings and at night, when you can control it outside of your work, this is the best you can do. You need to go analog, completely analog. And you need to add sleep, you need to add exercise, and you need to eat healthy. That's how brain. Dr. Daniel Amen, I'll show this to you Sunday morning. That's how Dr. Daniel Amen treats people. And it's amazing the before and after brain scans. During a detox, you re-implement all that stuff. If that does not fix it, you have to self-monitor and it'd be better for you to let someone like that beautiful person next to you monitor you for you because the person who is addicted is not qualified to self-diagnose. And then when they tell you you're addicted, don't get mad at them. Well, that's what happens most of the time. Who am not? Or to whom? Yeah. <laughs> Take it on board. I, I, I let my wife tell me. Believe me, she will. And if you still are having, I don't know if you are, but if you work in that industry and you're still depressed, you still have an anxiety, your brain won't switch off at night, you have every privilege from the word of God to go to God and say, would you be Jehovah Jireh to me and provide me another job? Because he says for you to take care of your temple because God lives in it. He will provide for you. You can trust him more than your job. I've had to. I'm on a very short faith leash given what I do. Very short. But he takes really good care of me. Does that help? So take care of what you can then I'll talk to your boss about the monotap, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff, because he'll think you're crazy, you're just lazy. But if I do it, it'd be different. It would. You hand him a video of me, then I leave the country, everything is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one or two more? Yes? Can we do one at a time? Because I get so confused. <laughs> all right. Everything. So, yes, word. Yeah, even word. So the question was, during the four to six weeks, does everything have to go, including email? Yes, which, in the book, not, not a shameless sell. Bye, bye, bye. Um, <laughs> a subliminal message there. You have to plan it. In other words, you don't need to run home tonight and just start. If you can, you should, but I mean, realistically, you need to uh, find out when the next time you have a holiday and then you ask the boss if you can tag on some of your accumulated work hours and you know whatever you have to do, you, you pray about this first because God will provide that for you. 
And if you could only do three weeks, and I'll show you this Sunday morning or Sunday night, that in three weeks, you're over the withdrawals. So just in three weeks, you're over the pain of it. But then you need another for, you know what neuroplasticity is? It's neuron development. It, that's a longer process. And you need at least another 21 days for habits, new habits to come in. You're not finished, but those habits over the long term of thinking if anything is praiseworthy, just, and of a good report. These poor neuroscientists, they go, you should think positive. It makes new brain growth. I'm like, well, duh, you're finally catching up with God. I'm serious. <laughs> Bless your little white-coated heart. <laughs> so that you need to plan it, and you need to ask God ahead of time. So you don't need to panic right now, and, but it needs to be done. And during that time, you're going to have to go cold turkey. You can try to wean if you want, but at some point, you're going to have to go cold turkey. So I designed the book. The first part, I say try to wean if you like, but it's to prep you for it. It's dealing with all this stuff, but then... The second part is all about the detox and then the maintenance. How do you stay sober? There is a such thing as digital sobriety. You have to stay sober. And so that's what we walk you through. I hope that helps. It's complicated, but God will, God will help you. Okay? Oh. You look friendly at this point. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, no, you. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes. So is that something that you're going to have to cut all the drugs? Because for me personally, I actually become a little bit anxious if I don't listen to music. So that's something I wonder about because I, I also write stories and I listen to music for inspiration. So that's obviously it's on work, so I don't know how I'm going to navigate it. <laughs> I just want to show you something, okay? Here's a neuroscientist. He's also a psychologist, but he's a neuroscientist who specializes in music. I want him to answer that question for you. A lot of people ask me, what's the best genre of music I should listen to when I want to concentrate? And the answer is none. <laughs> there are thousands of studies that show that if you're trying to concentrate and do some work, having music on in the background actually causes you to perform worse than if you didn't have music. The problem is that we find it more enjoyable with music, so we trick ourselves into thinking we're being more productive and efficient, but we're really not. What you can do, though, is take breaks, say every couple of hours, and listen to your favorite music for 10 or 15 minutes. Immerse yourself in that experience, and when you come back to your work, you'll be entirely refreshed. And there, there's no best genre, it's just whatever you happen to like. So music has this two-sided coin, it's when. So when you're sleeping and when you're having to concentrate, whether you study or at work, that's when it's bad for you. All right, guys, I hope it's been helpful. Can I pray for you? Because I'm going to slip out while I'm praying. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the receptivity that's been here tonight. I appreciate Shofar, always have. The openness here, God. Privileged to be among my family tonight. God, I do pray for those here who have been, been challenged, but yet something inside says, you know, I really want my feeling back toward God and my family. Honor that in them tonight. I believe your spirit's already been at work long before I got here. So Lord, empower, give continued revelation and understanding. God, I pray that groups will grab that book and just go through it together as friends and help one another through the detox and have the feeling come back and the intimacies with you and those, God, who are struggling because their work requires it. Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will give them answers to these very complex things that are legitimate questions to ask. God, our temples... Our bodies are temples of the living God. You've commanded us to look after them. Therefore, I have to believe that no matter what it takes and what sacrifices we make, whatever we give up, you will press it down, shake it up, and heap multitude back into us for whatever we have to do to come into alignment with you and your word. So bless my family here tonight. Lord, please, as I always ask, do not allow my friends here to come under condemnation. 
false guilt. For there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But Lord, give an excitement that feeling and emotions will, will come back to the things that are correct and right. Let intimacies among family members and marriages and so forth be restored. May the hunger for your word come that is so deep, so strong, that it just makes social media just drift into the background with no worries at all. We love you, Jesus. I pray for the porn addicts here. I pray for hope and healing. Full restoration, God. For the video game addicts, they probably were very angry at me at the first part. Put your arms around them. Give them peace. Just hold them. And let them enjoy that, God. Let them enjoy your presence more than any video game could ever give them. Lord, may your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Love you. Thank you so much, Brad. We're really looking forward to Sunday morning. So for the families at home, we love to see you Sunday morning, and the rest of you Sunday evening, you're welcome. We're going to follow up in three parts. Please buy a book at the back, and um, we've got some questions, some kind questions. You're welcome to talk to Brad now. Keep it light. Keep it light now. Sunday morning is the heavy stuff. I'm joking. Donkey, thank you so much for the tech team, for streaming. Jock, bye, Donkey. Nicole, thank you so much. Norita, God bless. Bye-bye.